Hey everyone, it's Christy. I am back with another episode of Evidence That Patriarchy is a Real Thing, and today I'm going to look at the issue of abortion. It's a very big topic, but I'm going to be focusing particularly on two aspects of patriarchy as relates to the issue of abortion in the United States in particular. So just to narrow the focus down, because usually in the titles I don't have room for all of the specifics, so try to lay it out initially. And so I'm going to be looking at legislation in the U.S. related to abortion and also a recent study put out by Media Matters looking at who appears on television news programs to talk about abortion. Before I start, I just want to anticipate some objections from anti-feminists who are going to read the title and then not watch the video and start writing things in the comments. So, am I saying men don't have a right to talk about abortion? No. Am I saying that men shouldn't be legislating when they are representatives on the issue of abortion? No. Am I saying that men shouldn't go on cable news networks and talk about abortion? No. What I'm saying is that we need women to do those things as well. And as you'll see from the clip that I'm going to show you from the Rachel Maddow show, as well as the study, it is men who are making decisions about abortion for women and really excluding women from the process, which we talk about patriarchy and seeing how men overwhelmingly hold positions of power and authority over women because of historical trends. And because we're used to seeing it, it doesn't look weird to us when we just see a room of men, usually white men, making decisions for an entire population when they're just one sliver of it. But when it comes to the issue of contraception and abortion, you start to see a bit more clearly why is it that it's a, a committee full of religious uh, religious leaders who are all men testifying before Congress on the issue of women's right to reproductive health care in the form of contraception. And so I wanted to use this opportunity to bring together two pieces of information, a segment from Rachel Maddow, who does a great job basically just outlining the symbolism, the political symbolism that a some governors have created around themselves on the issue of abortion and analyzing that. And then I also want to show you a, a small segment of the Media Matters study that came out today or yesterday. The overall study is beyond the sort of scope of patriarchy, but in terms of who gets to talk about the issues and what they get to say, it does get back to the issue of patriarchy. And that being the uh, disproportionate amount of power and authority that men hold relative to women and over women in the political, economic, social, and private spheres. And the more egalitarian we can get those each of those spheres, the less patriarchy we have. But when we look around us, we can definitely see that disproportionate amount of power that has historically been held by men is still being held by men over women. Let's start with the Rachel Maddow clip. To set this up, what I'm going to give you as background is that in the part of the video before this, she is talking about the nature of symbolism, political symbolism in images. And when you do official photos, what does that really communicate? What does this symbolism communicate? She talks about a bill that was passed in, I want to say it was Oklahoma, that allowed people to carry guns in churches. So for the official photo, they had a group of people sitting around the governor's desk and the governor had on his desk a picture, a book with Ronald Reagan on it with the picture out so you could see St. Ron on the table, a, a copy of the Holy Bible, a leather bound edition of the Bible, and that copy really, an edition of the Bible with a gun on the Bible. And she talks about the symbolism of that bill signing and then the fact that there were two bill signings that day and the second one was on a different issue so it required a po different political symbolism and then i'll just defer over here to rachel who will walk you through the rest of the segment here's the thing this was just one bill for which mississippi governor phil bryant did a big symbolic bill signing today and when it came time to do the other one he did it in the same room he did it from the same desk but it's time for new symbolism so we had to clear out all the people, right? Guns in churches time is now over. So the, the who would Jesus shoot folks all have to leave the office because now it's time for a new law, new symbolism for which the governor brought in a whole new set of stakeholders and interested parties for the photo op. Now notice the changes. For this one, different angle. So you can see the 10 commandments in the back corner. They have left the Reagan book on the desk there, see on the lower right hand side. They have also left the Bible there next to Reagan, but they've taken the gun off the Bible. 
And they have surrounded the governor with a whole new group of people who really count for this bill. They've surrounded him with a whole new group of people slash photo op human props who see their interests as most affected by this other new Mississippi law that was signed today. Because the other new Mississippi law that was signed today in a big symbolic photo op bill signing was for a new ban on a common form of surgical abortion. Governor Phil Bryant and these other four smiling white men gathering around a, to, to sign into law a bill to make sure your pregnancy proceeds according to their preferences under pain of criminal punishment. And you know, we know from the Guns and Churches bill signing that there were women available at the Mississippi governor's office today to put them in the picture in case they wanted to show that sort of thing. But instead, they went out of their way to make sure the bill signing picture for the new abortion law was just all white men. I know these guys are political pros, but it's just like they, it's like they don't know how this sort of thing will be received, right? They can't think enough outside themselves to realize what this might look like to other people, particularly to other people of the female persuasion. When Ohio Governor John Kasich signed legislation in 2011 that ended up closing nearly half the clinics that provide abortions in the state of Ohio, uh, notice something similar? Uh, this was his photo op that day. That's the photo op that Governor John Kasich staged in Ohio for signing that anti-abortion legislation. It was just him and a bunch of grown-ass white men. Uh, and for good measure, they included in that bill signing ceremony a very, very young man. They also brought in a little boy who the governor invited to sit on his lap and dot the I in the word Kasich as the men folk of Ohio got together to show the boy folk of Ohio how women's pregnancy can be controlled by the law. So this sort of thing happens in Mississippi, this sort of thing happens in, in, in Ohio. Uh, this sort of thing happened also in Indiana, sort of with a twist. This is what it looked like when Mike Pence signed one of his anti-abortion bills uh, in his state into law. They did include women, but see what I mean about the stakeholders issue. As you can see, when you're talking about issues related to the government interfering with a woman's right to control her own bodily destiny and decide what will and will not happen within her own body, having an all-male cohort behind you being surrounded by men and making these and, and passing laws and enforcing them on women just shows the the need to have women in the room, to have women's voices, to have women's physical presence there to be speaking about those experiences and how it affects women. I'm not saying that you're necessarily going to get a different outcome, but it looks really illegitimate to have people who will never get pregnant using the power of the state in order to impose their personal perspective onto women who aren't even part of the conversation as to what can happen with their bodies. On the second issue related to abortion and who gets to talk and who is given authority to talk about these kinds of issues, the Media Matters study focused on a lot of elements related to the discussion of abortion on U.S. cable news in the last, I think it was 14 months. So let me take you through a little bit of what I've prepared to cover the Media Matters story. News media have increasingly paid attention to this issue of all male panels. and. Again, it's not a problem if you have all men on a panel, but if you have, let's say, an entire day of speakers on an issue where in the audience it's very diverse, there are men and women, people from all different walks of life, and yet every speaker or 95% of the speakers all come from one narrow demographic within that larger audience, then people's voices are being excluded. And there's this new, I love this David Hasselhoff sticker for when you have an all-male panel, just kind of pointing out, again, making it more noticeable because we tend to take it for granted that male bodies are associated with power and we don't see the lack of women. So being sensitized to noticing where is everybody, where is the other half of the population? Or is, where are people of color in this? It might just be white women and white men. Where are people of color in this discussion? Becoming more sensitized to who gets to occupy those seats of, you know, of speaking privilege or authority. And as I said before, while it's noticeable in everyday life, it's really noticeable in issues like contraceptive access when you have all men testifying on the issue of women getting access to contraception. 
This is also pointed out when you had recently in Utah a legislative committee debating the whether or not to remove a common tax on tampons because tampons are seen as a luxury item. Pads apparently in a lot of states are not taxed, the basic sanitary pad, but tampons are, are a luxury. And so they're taxed. And I think a lot of women would agree that tampons are not a luxury and that they're a basic requirement. But having an all male panel debate whether or not women should be taxed on tampons being a luxury item, again, it, it's not that men can't have an opinion, but when you have only men in the room making decisions for women, it becomes really obvious that that there is a patriarchal structure here that empowers men and excludes women's voices. Media Matters analyzed evening and primetime news programs on Fox, CNN, and MSNBC from the 1st of January 2015 through the 6th of March 2016. They were looking for segments featuring a substantive discussion of abortion or organizations that supported or discouraged reproductive rights. All the speakers in these segments were labeled based on whether they had publicly identified as either pro-choice or anti-choice or had not publi ide publicly identified as either. Media Matters coded all of these statements made by the participants, noting whether the speaker made a statement that was contained within four types of abortion-related misinformation, which I'm going to skip for the purposes of time. But what I will raise here is this distribution of who is talking about abortion on the evening cable news. This slide shows the total number of uh, people talking by sex, and that includes guests, hosts, and correspondents. You, as you know, hosts are, are a stable part of every show. So if it's a white guy or if it's a black woman or, you know, whatever else, that person's going to be really stable. So there's two slides here. There's going to be the first one, which is everybody. And then the next one is just going to look at guests. Who do TV stations invite on to talk about abortion? As you can see here, on the issue of abortion in total, CNN 56% of their guests were male, 44% female. On Fox News, 66%, two-thirds of the guests talking about abortion were men, only one-third were women. On MSNBC, it was still imbalanced, 59% were men to 41% women. And the total distribution, when you average it across the three, where men in, in that time period were 62% of the guests, hosts, and correspondents who talked about abortion, whereas women were only 38%. The reason why it's important to look at the guests' figures separate from the correspondents or the hosts is because the networks get to choose who are their guests. They are the ones who go, okay, we need someone to talk about abortion. Who are we going to get? And the problem with sexist assumptions or the problem with being used to seeing uh, certain kinds of people in authority, namely white males as being authoritative in how they speak, is that news shows don't really, I think the problem is not a, a conspiracy to keep women off the air. It's these it's unconscious sexual biases that says, oh, well, we had this guy on before to talk abor about abortion. We'll just get him on again. And the networks aren't making an effort to diversify the people they bring on to ensure that a diverse range of voices on this topic is presented. And as you can see, when it comes to who gets invited on in terms of guests to talk about abortion in that time period, on CNN, 65% were men, 35% were women. Fox News, 63% were men, and 37% were women. MSNBC, that is what gender equality looks like. That's actually what egalitarianism looks like. So notice that, 51 to 49, 51% men, 49% women. That's what, like, equality would look like if it was all the way across all of the media, that's what it should look like. And then in total, it brings the average down slightly because of MSNBC's diversity to 60% of the total number of guests were men, where only 40% of the total guests were women. Who gets invited on these shows matters. And the solution to this is, again, not stopping men talking about abortion, not not inviting men onto TV shows. The solution is to get more women into the system so that they can be on air. And that doesn't mean that you just go, okay, we have a women's issue, so let's get some women on. 
We need to, women need to be talking about, you know, foreign security. We need to see their representation on that increase, on domestic security, on economics. We just need more of a balance. And it's not just men versus women either. It's also about diverse backgrounds. We need Hispanic Americans. We need black Americans. We need to show the full range of talent of people who are out there doing great work so that we can get that full range of what America really is represented back to us on the television screen. If the media wants to be representative, they tend to do things like the left and the right, and they'll get one person from the Republican side and one person from the Democratic side. But if you're only asking white men to come up and be the voice for everybody, you're not actually getting everybody's voice. That's why diversity in representation is important. And the way that news agencies do that is just to make a bit more effort to think outside the box and get in new guests and try to always be recruiting new people and looking at their own guest panels to see, do our guests reflect America? Does what we put on air actually look like what other Americans see when they go out of their house and experience life? That's going to wrap it up here for me. And so all I think that's left to be said now is the usual. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. And I will be making more videos very soon.